As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, verse 12. He will again have compassion on, on us and subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, verse 19. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly de delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Isaiah 38, verse 17. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1.18 let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 7. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of the heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Micah 7, 18. This I recall to my mind, therefore I had hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even though we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. I want to invite you to open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And while you're turning there this, moment, this morning, allow me just a moment to express my personal deep gratitude to the Brown Trail Church for the great work that you continue to do for the cause of Christ, especially in this area but throughout the world. We are all indeed indebted to Brown Trail for the training of so many uh, wonderful preachers through the years, and we continue to be grateful to you for your work. I want to express my appreciation to Brother Maxie Boren for his work in planning this lectureship, in particular to him for the honor that he is placing upon our family this week and for the invitation to speak. I want to express my appreciation to two of my elders who are with me this morning, and I'm glad that they made the, the drive over to come and be a part of, of this program. And I want to express my personal gratitude to my dearest friend in this world, Tommy Haynes, who about 10 years ago invited me when I moved to Oklahoma to come down to Brown Trail to attend the Fort Worth Lectures. I confess to you, I'd never heard of the Fort Worth Lectures before, but he invited me to attend, and we have been able to be at these lectures together, everyone, for the past 10 years, and uh, I'm very thankful to him for that. Um, Brother Maxie called this the promised land. Brother Maxie, all of my life I've wanted to do foreign mission work, so the Lord allowed me to move to Texas. <laughs> That's what people on the east side of the Mississippi River think. But it is a, a privilege to be here to be with you today. All these things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for God. As though God are for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Ladies and gentlemen, the work of the church is to preach the gospel to sinners so that they might be reconciled to God. The authors of Holy Scripture have painted for us upon the canvas of the Word of God a beautiful description of thanksgiving for the forgiveness of God. God has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. He has cast them into the depths of the sea. He has thrown them behind His back. He has abundantly pardoned us. To us has been given the ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation. And that's what this gospel, this good news is all about. It is possible for sinners to be forgiven. It is possible for mankind to once again be reconciled to God. 
And that's why we live. That's why the church exists. That's what we preach. That's what we teach. That's why we sing. That is why we are here. Sometimes we get a little distracted. Our minds are focused in another direction. Sometimes we're taken off the track, if you will. But may we always remember that the main thing, the reason we exist, is to tell people that God will forgive their sins. Now, from man's viewpoint, it is an impossibility to reconcile sinners with an absolute, utterly perfect and holy God. From our standpoint, it would be inconceivable that a man could concoct some kind of scheme by which he could come before a holy God and somehow satisfy his justice and his wrath and his holiness and at the same time receive complete forgiveness from God. From our viewpoint, it is an impossibility. But based upon the text that I read a moment ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let me draw four observations that might help us come to appreciate even more the forgiveness of God. Number one, I want you to notice that the forgiveness of God was initiated by God Himself. It began in the mind of God. If you'll look at verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 5 once again, Paul says, now all these things are of God. What things are you talking about, Paul? When you go back to verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so when Paul says in verse 18, all these things are of God, he is making reference to everything that is in regard to the salvation process. This began in the mind of God. This verse is describing, verse 17, the conversion of a lost person. And all the issues in regard to conversion began with God, Paul says. Sinners could not be reconciled to God. They could not decide to pull it off. We cannot devise a plan to make it happen. We have no power within us to satisfy God's anger towards sin. We have no virtue to charm Him. We are all offenders. We are hopeless and we are helpless. We are doomed. As Paul would say in Ephesians 2 verse 12, we are without God. That's why he writes in Romans 3 and he says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why he says in verses 9 and 10 of that same chapter, There is none righteous, no, not one. We cannot devise a scheme whereby we can come before a holy God and save ourselves. But into the midst of this, Jesus Christ was sent into the world so that sinners might be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Romans 5 8, Paul says, But God demonstrated, He commendeth, I think the old King James says, but He demonstrated, He showed His love for us that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so in the midst of a world of sin, God sends forgiveness through the message which is Jesus Christ. It was His desire to make us His children. And while this is not foreign to any of you who are present today, do you understand, do you realize that this is extremely foreign to the vast majority of people who live on this planet we call Earth? Most people do not know that God is a loving God who wants men to be reconciled to Him. Most people do not know that God sent His Son to die upon the cross so that mankind might be forgiven. Most people do not understand that we should be thankful for the forgiveness of God. For instance, the Muslim believes that God is an angry God who has to be cajoled and coddled in the hope that he might find whimsy to be favorable in, in some way to those of us who are sinners. Two or three years ago, I was preaching down in Houston and we had a family in the church in Oklahoma City and they had a son who had moved to Houston to attend one of the universities there and they were concerned about him. He had left the church and they said, would you try to meet with him? And so we set up a meeting one night about, um, about 9.30 after the service and we met at a restaurant and we began to talk about the scriptures and he brought with him uh, his friend who was teaching him, a Muslim cleric. And we began to talk about the Bible and through the course of the two and a half hour conversation I said to this Muslim teacher, Sir, do you believe that when you die you will go to heaven? And he said to me, I have no idea. I don't know. 
And I said, suppose that God allowed you to go to heaven. Suppose you do go to heaven. What would be the basis for God allowing you to go to heaven? And he said, if somehow I get into heaven, if God lets me go to heaven, it will be because in my lifetime I do more good than I do bad. That's the only way I can get to heaven. He believes that God is an angry God. And most of the world religions are bound up in fear. And, and God is angry, either angry or indifferent toward them. And in the midst of all of this, Jesus comes with his truth. And he says, God loves sinners. And he seeks to reconcile them to himself. God, our Savior, who would have all men to be saved. God, who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. In Paul's letter to Titus, God, the, the name of God is mentioned three times after the introduction. The name of God is mentioned once in chapter 1, once in chapter 2, and once in chapter 3. Each time Paul gives a descriptive title for God, and I want you to notice what he says. Each time in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, he says, God our Savior, God our Savior, God our Savior. Three times the name of Jesus Christ is mentioned after the introduction. Once in chapter 1, once in chapter 2, and once in chapter 3. Each of these times he says, Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus Christ the Savior of all men. Jesus Christ our Savior. God is such a Savior by nature. He is so disposed to saving people that according to 1 Timothy 4 verse 10, and this is a monumental statement, God is the Savior of all men. Especially the word especially is a little Greek adverb, melista, and it means especially those who believe. God is so saving by His nature that He is even the Savior of, of all men in some way. And the question is, in what way is God the Savior of all men? This is not the teaching, the doctrine of universalism, that all men are going to be saved. But He is the Savior in the sense that He has made salvation available to all men. Titus 2 says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. God is also the Savior of all men in a temporal way. You can see the saving character of God, the gracious, merciful, loving kindness of God, even in the way that He deals with sinful man. He allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. The wicked, non-religious people of our world laugh and they sing and they enjoy temporal blessings of this earth. They see the sunset and they smell the flowers and God doesn't immediately take their lives the first time they commit sin. The very character of God as a saving God is manifest in our world, but especially to those who believe. We do not serve a God that we have to appease. We have a God who longs to save sinners. He is ready to pardon. He will abundantly pardon. He is called in Micah, 9, Micah 7 verse 18, the pardoning God. And this reconciliation, this beautiful forgiveness of God is the divine provision by which God's holy displeasure has been appeased. The hostility has been removed and sinners have been restored to Him. Listen. We do not make reconciliation possible, we receive it. It is not by our achievement, it is not something that we accomplish. When we make up our mind, we're going to come before God, but it is something that He accomplished when He decided before the foundation of the world that I will save those who believe and obey. Reconciliation, forgiveness, begins in the mind of God. The second thing I would like for you to notice this morning is that forgiveness is by an act that was performed by God. Verse 19, notice he says, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God was in Christ. Well, how was he doing that? The world here means mankind. It is a generic term. It is to say to us that God was doing his saving work on behalf of man. So God will reconcile everyone who obeys Him, how? By not imputing their trespasses to them. The way that God reconciles sinners is by not counting their trespasses against them or simply put, by forgiving their sins. 
And that is the heart of justification, that God forgives sins. That's what we preach. Blessed is the man, Paul wrote in Romans 4 verse 8, whose sin the Lord will not take into account. David proclaimed after he had committed the gross iniquity with Bathsheba and the plot to have her husband Uriah killed. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. And brother, you better believe David had amassed a mountain of iniquity. And he knew happy is the one to whom God will not impute that iniquity. He was blessed to know that God forgives sin. And we ought to not only be thankful that God forgives sin, but we ought to recognize what a blessing it is to us. Justification is not on our terms, but it is on His. Our message is that God forgives sins. But we must explain to the lost that, that this idea of forgiveness is not because of what we do, but it is on God's terms. And when the gospel is, when we understand that the gospel is the message of forgiveness, and I know that you know this, but it must be at the heart of everything that we do. God will forgive your sins. And we need to make that the, the central point, the focus of everything that we do in the life of the church. Preaching brethren, the message that we are to proclaim is that God forgives sins. Elders, the message that you are to proclaim to the church is that God forgives sins. We are to say to a lost and dying world that because of an act that God performed, He forgives sins. Not only does it begin in the mind of God and it was accomplished by an act that God performed, I want you to notice also that this forgiveness is made possible by our obedience. And so notice verse 20. Now then, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God initiated it. God performed an act that made it possible, but it is our obedience. Somebody says, what is our part and do we have a part? You understand today that there are many throughout the world and even those who claim to be members of the church who tell us that there is nothing that we do, that we do not, for instance, contribute one whit to our salvation. And if that is the case, why would Paul write to people and say to them, we beg you, we implore you on Christ's behalf, you be reconciled to God. Paul has made it clear that God initiated this reconciliation. He made it clear that God began the process, but he said, we beg you, you be reconciled to God. There is a part that we must play, and that part is obedience. We believe and we obey this gospel. It is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. We preach the gospel. Preachers are sent out to preach the good news. As we read in Romans chapter 10, it is through the foolishness of preaching that God chose to save the world. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. And let me just take a moment to say here that what we need more in the church is we need more gospel preaching. We need to spend more time preaching rather than less time preaching. It is amazing to me to see churches, congregations of God's people who are saying we need to cut out preaching, we don't need to have as much preaching. I had a fellow recently tell me that his sermons last 10 minutes. They spend time showing video clips, they spend time watching movies, they spend time uh, having dr dramatic presentations, but where is time for the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is through the foolishness of preaching that God chose to save man. And May I encourage you, brethren who are elders, not to take away from the preaching of the gospel, but if you do anything, give more time to the preaching of the gospel. It is through that power that men will be saved. And this reconciliation comes to a person only when they are willing to obey. Well, how does this happen? How do we understand this forgiveness? How does this transaction occur? How can He look upon us as sinners and desire any fellowship with us? How can He satisfy His just and holy condemnation of sin and give full and deserved punishment to the sinner and at the same time embrace the sinner? Well, that brings us to the fourth observation, and that is that forgiveness is possible because of the work of substitution. Notice again with me in verse 21. And this is perhaps one of the most profound statements in all the Bible. 
For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That is a monumental statement. In order to reconcile sinners, He made Him who knew no sin to become sin. He made, that's talking about God. God made Him who knew no sin. Well, who, who is that talking about? Well, as one writer said, the field becomes very narrow at this point. There's only one individual who's ever walked this earth who knew no sin. It is the man Jesus Christ. God made Him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us. This is the one of whom the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 7, He is holy and harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners. The one who said of himself, Which of you brings any charges against me? The one of whom Pilate said, I can find no fault in this man. The one of whom Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The one of whom the Father said, and this is the most monumental testimony of all to His perfectness, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There is only one who knew no sin. And in order for us to experience the marvelous forgiveness of God, it had to be accomplished through the work of substitution. What do we mean by that? He made him who knew no sin. You understand what that means? I've heard some pretty bizarre things about this. I've heard some frightening statements. I've heard people say, well, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, that he temporarily became a sinner. No, a thousand times no. Please don't ever accept that. Don't believe that for one minute second that Jesus was guilty of any sin. Jesus was not a sinner. He was the sinless Son of God. He was the spotless Lamb. And He was as holy while He was hanging on the cross as He had ever been in eternity before and as He ever would be in eternity after. Don't you know that if Jesus would have sinned, that He would have died and gone to hell for His own iniquities and He would not have had the power to save any of us? Well, if Jesus didn't become a sinner... In what way was he made sin? In only one way. Isaiah 53 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastening of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He became our substitute. Though Jesus never committed a single sin, God treated him as if he had personally committed every sin that had ever been committed by every person who would ever walk upon the earth. And he punished him for them all, though in reality he never committed one. That substitution. Do you think that that lamb that was placed on the altar over there in the Old Testament was guilty? Why, of course not. Do you think that that scapegoat that... We read about in the book of Leviticus when they symbolically took their sins and placed it upon that scapegoat and ran him off into the wilderness. Do you think that he was guilty? Why, of course not. And neither was the spotless Lamb of God. He was holy and harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners. And that's why in shattered devastation he cried out in the midst of agony, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Martin Luther looked at that and he said, God forsake God? How can this be? I'll tell you how it can be. It is because of me. It's because of my sins that God forsook God. It's because of your sins that the God of the universe looked away. The Bible tells us in the book of Habakkuk, That God's eyes are too pure to look upon evil. And God had all of the sins of all the world focused in the person of Jesus Christ while He hung upon the cross and the God of the universe could not look. And He treated His Son as if He had committed sin. And he took the penalty for all of those sins and he crushed the life out of Jesus with his wrath. There's other verses in Isaiah 53 that I don't quite understand. Verse 10, he separated his soul unto death. Verse 12, 
He separated his soul to death. Now we know that Jesus gave his life. But what does it mean that he separated his soul to death? That's the only way, the only sense in which Jesus became sin for us. Now the question is, how can we not love someone supremely who would do something like that for us? How could we not express on a a daily, an hourly basis our gratitude to Him for forgiving us? Galatians 3 says He became a curse for us. And the rest of 2 Corinthians 5 is is mind-boggling to me. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Let me ask you a question today. Are you perfectly righteous? And every one of us would have to say no. We are not sinless. We are not righteous like Christ. We are not holy like God. We hang our heads in shame because of the sins that we have committed in our lives. But look at what the text says. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And that's the other side of the coin of substitution. Just as God treated Christ as if he had sinned, he treats us like we are righteous. That's forgiveness. That's the gospel message. I'm not sinless. I'm not righteous. God in His grace and His mercy treats me like I am because He poured out His wrath on His Son. I don't know how old I was, but I can vividly remember I had to be 10 years or close to that age hearing for the first time my dad tell the story in the pulpit that I heard him tell numerous times after that. You've heard the story before. A one-room schoolhouse in a community that couldn't keep a teacher. Every year they would get a teacher and he couldn't last and so they'd get another one the next year. They finally hired a young man just out of college and he came to teach and when he got there on the first day he said, now a school is no good without rules so we have to have rules. I'm going to allow the students to make the rules. Somebody yelled out, no fighting. He wrote on the board, no fighting. No cheating, he wrote, no cheating, no stealing, he wrote, no stealing, no lying. And before long, the entire room was filled with the rules that the students had made. And he said, now we can't have rules unless there's punishment when the rules are broken. Big George raised his hand and said, I suggest that whoever gets caught breaking any of these rules receives five hard licks with a paddle. The teacher said that'll be the punishment. Things went along fine for a while, and then one day, little Bill, the smallest boy in class, was caught stealing somebody else's lunch. The teacher called the students around, said there's got to be the punishment given out. Take your coat off, and when he did, he didn't have a shirt on his back, and he said, where's your shirt? And he said, teacher, you know my mama died last year. My daddy's doing the best he can. I took that lunch to give to my little sister because we don't have enough food. The teacher said the rules have been broken. The punishment must be given. Big George raised his hand. He said, Teacher, I'd like to take his whipping for him. That's what we read about in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We were all sinners. We were without God. We had broken the rules. We deserved the punishment. And Jesus, our big brother, stands up and he says, Father, I'll take their punishment for them. For God so loved the world that He gave. And I know people that don't even want to give up their seat at church for a visitor. For God so loved the world that He gave. And if you think that He has called us to a life of luxury and self-appeasement, not only is, is that unbiblical, but it doesn't help anybody. He loved us so much that He gave, and we are called upon to give. Notice with me the last two words in this verse. For He made Him who knew knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. It is so amazing to me to hear 
preachers today who are telling us that baptism is not important. You don't need to be baptized to be saved. You can be saved simply by calling on the name of the Lord. You can be saved by saying the sinner's prayer. You can be saved by living the way that you're living. You can be saved by joining a church. This forgiveness that we're talking about that is so marvelous and wonderful and beautiful can only occur in one place, only in Christ. As Brother Marshall Keeble used to say, you can read the Bible from kiver to kiver and there's only one way you can learn how to get into Christ. That's by being baptized into Christ. And we need to say to the world and we need to say to the church that no man who is outside of Christ is in a safe condition and no man can be in Christ until he is baptized into Christ. And Jesus Christ didn't give up His lifeblood in His mansion in heaven. He didn't die upon the cross for our sins so that we could come up with our own plan to save man and so that we can say that, that what the Scriptures teach don't matter. How dare we assume or presume that we somehow have a better plan than God has. And sometimes when you preach about baptism and the necessity and the essentiality of baptism, you're called narrow-minded. They'll say that you are unloving and that you're uncaring and that you're too rigid. They'll say that you're intolerant and that you're arrogant. I'll tell you what arrogance is. Arrogance is when some preacher stands up and says, I don't care what the Bible says, I'll tell you what I believe. Arrogance is when you say, I, I have my own plan and, and any man's plan is just as good as God's plan. Forgiveness is possible only in Christ. And we have the opportunity to say to a lost and dying world, you can have forgiveness of sins. That's what we preach to the world. But we better not fall short of telling them that you can have forgiveness of sins without being obedient to Jesus Christ. I heard a fellow present a message at a lectureship at one of our Christian schools. And his assignment was Acts chapter 2. And he read up to verse 37. And he never talked about verse 38 or the following verses. This forgiveness is possible only in him. And we should say to the world, thank God that Jesus Christ shed his blood for us. Is it too much for us to be obedient to him? Therefore, along with Paul, my brothers, I implore you today, I implore all of us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the lost and dying world, to tell them that forgiveness was initiated in the mind of God, that forgiveness is made possible because of an act that God performed, that forgiveness comes about when we obey, and that forgiveness is due to the marvelous work of substitution. And that is the gospel that we preach.